Hello everybody. So this is the tutorial about BPF, understanding what happens inside Kubernetes clusters using BPF tools. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Alban. I'm a co-founder and director at Gifrog Labs. Uh, we do consulting and engineering around open source projects um, related to Linux and Kubernetes. Uh, so Gifrog Labs is a dedicated team. We focus on innovation in, on our own open source projects and we collaborate with other software companies on upstream projects. Hi, I'm Marga. I also work at Kinfolk with Alban. I'm in the Flatcar Container Linux team. Flatcar is a container optimized OS, uh, and it's usually used as the OS when you run Kubernetes clusters. Uh, Flatcar is one of the options of the OSs that you can run in your nodes. And I'm very excited about joining Alban today in this BPF tutorial because I think BPF tools are really cool. Thanks. Um, I mentioned Kilfog before. Um, our, our tagline is building the 100% open enterprise cloud native stack. And uh, Marga mentioned uh, Flatcar Container Linux. We also have Locomotive, our Kubernetes distribution. But everything we will show today is not related to our product. It can also apply to other Linux distribution and other Kubernetes distribution. All right, so we are going to do a very interactive tutorial. And this tutorial uh, is uh, stored in a Git repo. And in order for you to follow along, you should clone this Git repo that we are showing here and uh, install it in your computer or a VM if you don't want to run it in your computer and follow all the instructions that we have there. Uh, we published the URL for this repo in advance, so maybe you already did this, but if you didn't do it, don't panic. Uh, you can still do it now, and you're in time to do it now and follow along uh, with the tutorial. Mm, there's, there's a bunch of requirements that we list here. Uh, Minikube and the latest version of Spectral Gadget and kubectl trace. We will install these uh, requirements um, right now, like after this slide. Um, but if you don't want to use Minikube and you want to use a different Kubernetes distribution, that's also possible. The tricky thing is that you need to have the kernel headers available. So if you want to like run this in GKE or EKS or whatever, you need to make sure that you have the kernel headers that of the running kernel of your nodes installed. Otherwise, you can't run the BPF tools because BPF tools require access to the kernel headers. Uh, we provided this image of Minikube that already has the headers. So if you are just getting ready right now, I strongly recommend that you just go with this Minikube image that already has the headers and hopefully everything will be solved for you. Uh, but like maybe you did this in advance and you want to use a different Kubernetes distribution and that's also possible. All right, uh, so I, yes. So the first hands-on task is to get ready and install Minikube. Um, just a second. I will share my screen. Okay, so the first thing we will do is clone the repo. So git clone and then HTTPS. I'm going to do this with you. So like if you are doing this right now, you have time to type the URL and clone the repo. All right, we've cloned the repo and we can look at the contents. It has a bunch of directories with all the steps of the things that we will do. And the first thing that we will do is go into the getting started directory and 
here we have a bunch of scripts that can help us get started. Um, there's these Ubuntu devs. Actually, it also works for Debian and a bunch of other Debian or Ubuntu similar distribution that installs a bunch of dependencies that maybe you already have in your computer, maybe you don't. And then there's this start mini cube and get inspector gadget. So all these things we will execute first. Let's go with Ubuntu devs to make sure that we have all the dependencies because we are running on an Ubuntu machine. So, okay, so we had everything good. But if you were missing some dependency, this will have installed your dependency. Let's have a look at uh, what we are actually executing. So be before I just execute it, but let's let's look at the start Minikube script. So to have a look at what it does. So what it does is it first downloads a couple of Minikube components. Uh, as I mentioned, these components already come with the kernel headers, which is the, the one thing that might be tricky when dealing with BPF. It verifies that they are correct. It then, it asks us whether we are sure that we want to do this or not. And this is because if you already have Minikube running in your computer, this could cause your Minikube to stop. So this like lets you know that be careful, this could make your Minikube stop. And then if we say yes, it deletes whatever Minikube you had running and starts a new one. There's this use driver non flag, which is uh, reserved only if you are running this inside a virtual machine. So for example, if you are running this on a Linux virtual machine inside a Windows machine, or if you're running this in the cloud in a virtual machine given to you by some cloud provider, you might need to use this use driver non flag. Otherwise, if you are running this on your laptop, on a workstation or any other bare metal machine, you just don't use that flag. And well, you can see here that Minikube is started. It started with the ISO file that we were going to download and that everything is configured so that uh, we can start using our VPF tools. So let's execute this script. Okay, it's downloading and it's now it asking me if I want to actually do this. Yes, I want to actually do this. And this will now take a while because it downloads a bunch of components. It starts the, the Kubernetes cluster. So it takes a while. So while that is running, we will go back to the slides and we will uh, keep talking a little bit about why we are here and what's the problem that we are trying to solve. And yeah, and if you have any issues, like just make sure you ask on the chat, uh, read the documentation and see if you can solve them. Hopefully everything will work out, but if it doesn't, we will try to help you get there. Okay. So, oops. All right, so uh, as the title of the tutorial says, the goal of the tools that we will demonstrate today is to understand what's going on inside our Kubernetes clusters. Debugging in general is hard. It's, it's an art and it takes a time to master, but as our applications get more complex and in particular when they are distributed applications that are running inside a Kubernetes cluster, it becomes really, really hard to debug what's going on. So we can benefit from tools that exist out there. In particular, the BPF tracing tools have been developed to help us understand what's going on inside our applications, but they were developed to debug local machines. So it's kind of hard to run the BPF tools that exist uh, inside Kubernetes cluster. And the tools that we will demonstrate today do exactly that. They help us run BPF tracing uh, expressions and uh, programs inside our Kubernetes clusters in a way that it's much easier than if we were trying to wire all of this ourselves. Um, 
So we will demonstrate two tools. Uh, the first tool is called Inspector Gadget. And the second tool is called QCTL Trace. We will see both of these tools in action. They are both very useful. Uh, they have different use cases. So we will try to see the different use cases and how we can use these tools to solve our problems. And to help us understand more about what BPF is, Alba and we now explain a little bit more of how all of this works. Alba, you are muted. Thanks, Maria. So, um, to introduce BPF, uh, BPF uh, was initially uh, created uh, for uh, TCP done. And uh, initially, the use case was for socket filtering on socket. That means when you want to capture your network traffic, uh, it, it used this BPF program to decide which packet to capture. Uh, that was initially the first use case, but since then it was extended to a lot more use case and it's become called uh, eBPF or extended BPF uh, more recently, 2013. And the additional use case were uh, in different, different categories uh, about networking, so uh, like TCP dump or traffic shipping, network traffic shipping, uh, about Security, uh, there is a second to filter what kind of system call you can do. Or uh, about a uh, Linux security module, there are BPF programs uh, designed to decide what can you do on your system. Um, and about tracing. So tracing is the topic of today. And we will focus only on that uh, in this talk. And a BPF program for tracing can be uh, in different subcategories. There are uh, BPF programs for trace points, where you, um, um, it's a hook in the Linux kernel where you decide to execute uh, something to add specific trace points that have been introduced in the Linux kernel, or kprob, where you can trace any function in the Linux kernel, or new probs, and so on. So in a nutshell, it looks like that. Uh, when you want to write a BPF program, you uh, usually don't write the bad code, but write a program in C, or at least it looks like C, or a subset of the C language. And uh, once you have written your code, it can be compiled by uh, CLang and LLVM. And after that, you get an um, ELF object, or BPF by code, um, that is uh, compiled uh, BPF. Once you have your compiled BPF, uh, you can upload this program into the kernel with a BPF system call, and then what will the kernel do with that? Well, the first step is to verify that the program is okay, like it's safe to execute. Uh, as you might know, executing things in the kernel can be dangerous. Like if you write bad kernel modules and you execute them, there is a risk you can crash the machine. Uh, with BPF, it's a bit different. There is a verifier that checks that uh, only safe instruction can be done. So it will not access any random memory in the kernel or uh, do bad calls there. Uh, once the kernel has assessed that it's safe to execute this BPF program, it will be installed somewhere. And this BPF program can um, be attached to a specific subsystem. For example, if it is um, for capturing network packet with TCP dump, then it will be executed for each packet uh, uh, traveling on the network. Or if it is uh, for tracing on a kprob, it can be executed for every kernel function that is executed. Um, so this BPF program can uh, cannot do everything. It will only um, be able to do a, a safe instruction. It's like it's in a sandbox. And it will be able to interact with um, um, the tracer application uh, through BPF maps. Uh, BPF maps is kind of a global variable uh, that is shared between the kernel and application in user space. Um, and there are such variables uh, of different types, for example, a hash map or array and so on. And BPF maps um, 
both the uh, BPF program and the application can read and write on those variables on those BPF map, and that's how um, it communicates. And finally, the BPF program cannot execute any uh, kernel function, even though it's run inside the kernel. It only allows access to a specific um, BPF helper function to only run uh, safe functions that has been designed for that. Um, so using, using BPF um, for tracing, uh, there are a lot of different projects uh, that do that. Uh, I put them in two categories here. Uh, first on the left, a Linux tracing tool. So there are things that are not cluster aware. It runs on a single uh, Linux machine. Uh, I'll list here BPF trace, which um, is a cool project that you can write um, uh, one-liners or a small amount of code and do uh, cool tracing inside uh, uh, using BPF. Another project um, is BCC. Uh, so the B BPF compiler collection is a really interesting resource to uh, learn how to do BPF because it has a lot of uh, tracing tools and uh, maybe a hundred, I don't know how many exactly, but you can uh, see the example and see how it's done and read the source code to see uh, how you can do different things in BPF. Um, so that's a really cool uh, learning resource. It has a lot of uh, tracing tools and it's also um, a library for uh, BPF. So uh, if you write code in C or C++ or Python, they are binding for Python as well, or Lua, there are uh, libraries for, to do that. The next project I mentioned today is Traceloop. Uh, I will talk about that more in details later, but that's uh, another way of tracing uh, your programs. And I mentioned a few others. So all of them on the uh, left side is uh, tracing on a single Linux machine, but there is other uh, equivalent for tracing on a Kubernetes level. Um, so there is kubectl trace that use uh, BPF trace um, at the Kubernetes level, and there is inspector gadget that uh, reuse a bunch of different tools to uh, uh, offer a user experience uh, similar to kubectl on Kubernetes. Uh, so you can manipulate things on a cluster level. All right, so going back to our Minikube installation, we see that everything worked correctly and that we now have Minikube running. We can, for example, do kubectl get pods-a and we see that we have a basic Kubernetes system running in our node, so that's good. Um, and one thing I'm going to do now is because uh, one of the things we did was download this mini cube command that we will use later. So I'm going to copy this mini cube command to the bin folder in my home directory. And I've already set up the path variable to include that bin folder. So now this mini cube command is in the path. So later, when we execute it from somewhere else, uh, it will be in the path. Otherwise, we would need to type this 00, zero getting started folder name each time we want to execute it, which is not a big deal, but just to make things easier. All right, so that's installed. And then the next thing we need to make, like you need to make sure is you have kubectl. I already showed that I do have kubectl. Uh, if you don't have kubectl installed, you need to install it because otherwise you will not be able to interact with your Kubernetes cluster. And then next step is to install inspector gadget. To do that, we will use this handy get inspector gadget script and we are going to look at it before we execute it so that we make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And well, the first thing it does is it checks kubectl is installed and then it checks that inspector gadget is not installed because if it's already installed, there's nothing to do. And then it either uses crew if crew is available because that's the recommended way of installing it or it downloads the file and installs it and it then copies it to the same path where kubectl is installed. So wherever you have kubectl installed, you will also get the gadget plugin installed. And then in the end, it verifies that it worked. So 
let's execute this now. And I think because we already tested this, it will just say that it's already installed. Yeah, because we tested this before. And so <laughs> it it's already installed. But if, if, if it was not installed, it would be like downloading and installing now. And we can do, for example, kubectl gadget uh, version and see that it's there. And then we could do like help. And we can see that this kubectl gadget plugin has a bunch of subcommands that we can use. And these commands are the ones that we will be demonstrating. Uh, well, not all of them, but a bunch of them we will be demonstrating throughout this tutorial um, so that, yeah, so that we have a little bit of an idea of what all of this is. All right, and the first subcommand that we will use is this deploy uh, command, which the description here says deploy inspector gadget on the worker nodes. And what this does is it deploys a container into the worker nodes that will run the BPF commands for us. So first let's run kubectl gadget deploy five less so that we see what it's doing. And we see that it will create a cluster role binding, a daemon set with a bunch of stuff and it downloads a container image with inspector gadget in it. Okay, so yeah, it will do a bunch of stuff. It looks, everything looks sensible. So we can now apply it. Okay, yes, oops, uh, all right. So uh, this created the service account, the cluster row binding and the daemon set. And we can see that it's actually running. And we see now that we have this gadget pod that it's creating and we can wait a few more seconds and it should be done. Yeah, so now it's running and we have the gadget pod running in our cluster and we can check the logs to see <laughs> that everything is correct. And we use the label because yeah, why not? Yeah, and we see that it started, everything started, there's no error. So our gadget pod is running correctly in the cluster and we are ready to do interesting things with inspector gadget. So, so what can we actually do with that? Let's go back to the slides. There. Okay. And so the first gadget that we will look at is called Network Policy Advisor. And this gadget is designed to help us understand the network policies that are necessary for a project when we don't really have a clear picture of what the project does. So imagine, for example, that you just join a team that has a big Kubernetes deployment and you like you know that it has a lot of pods, services, daemon sets, everything is like communicating with each other but the project doesn't have any network policies whatsoever. Everything is completely open. If there was like anything malicious to break into the system, there would be like no gating communication. Everything would be like just communicating everywhere. And to make things worse, you are the one that's tasked with coming up with network policies to make this better. And you're just new and everything is a mess and you have no idea where to start. So. This is where the network policy advisor comes in. Uh, this is not just su such a rare story. It's pretty common that network policy is an afterthought. And so this is why it made sense to have a gadget that would help us understand what's going on inside our clusters and how uh, we can uh, write the right network policies. So for our hands-on example, we will use this microservices demo from Google, it's actually a demo of like how you write a microservices application for an e-commerce. And so it has a lot of different components like a database, a checkout service, a shipping service, like a bunch of stuff. We don't really care about all this stuff uh, for like seeing them in practice, but what we care about is that it already has a bunch of containers, a bunch of pods, services, 
that are like transmitting data from one side to the other and it's it doesn't have network policies so it's a great example for seeing the network policy advisor in action so all right so i think it's time for our next hands-on task which we to actually start it so we will now move to the previous the other directory so the 01 network policy advisor directory and in this directory we see this kubernetes manifest yaml file which uh, it's a copy from this google example that i was talking about and yeah let's let's have a quick look at it i'm i'm just scrolling through it very quickly you see it has a ton of different things we can like just see the different kinds of things it has and we see it has a bunch of deployments and a bunch of services and all of these deployments and services have a, a bunch of configurations in them so it's complicated and we don't want to spend a lot of time like thinking about it so what we will do is um oh i need to split my screen so first let me start tmux and so what we will do is first start the network policy in monitor mode. And to do that, I will do kubectl gadget network policy monitor. And then I will tell it to monitor on the namespaces demo because that's where we will deploy this and then store the output in a file that we will call network trace.log. All right, so this is now monitoring for new connections on this um, uh, names on this demo namespace and it's going to store all of that in this network trace log. So now we need to actually create these new connections and let's now split the screen. Uh, there okay so uh what i'm going to do now is in this other side is first create the demo namespace and now apply this file that we were looking at before in the demo namespace okay so it created all those things that we said would be created this will take a while to like every for everything to get ready um demo so everything or almost everything is now container creating it will take a while until it's ready but we can just tail the log and we can wait to see if we start getting something if we don't get anything it means i made a mistake but i think i did it correctly Yes, okay. So we are getting some entries in the log and this will take a while until everything is ready and until the log makes sense. So while this is running, we can go back to the slides and explain a little bit more about um, what's going on. All right, so, so these were the commands that we run, just, uh, to highlight them. And what we what we did was first start the network policy advisor in monitor mode, because we need this to be running early so that it can capture all the connections that happen. If we started late, there might be some connections that would not have been captured. So that's why we, we did this thing of like running it first and then running the other command. And yeah, and then uh, as we said, this thing is going to like store all the things in, in a log. Um, yeah, all right. So, but let's look a little bit more as how this is working inside. So in this diagram, we, we see a diagram of how gadget works. Uh, and one of the things that we want to highlight is that everything goes through the Kubernetes API. So it's not that it's talking directly to the nodes directly to the kernel running in the nodes where the BPF tracing is going to happen, 
but rather everything is going through the API. The first thing we did was deploy this gadget pod that is deployed one pod per node. In our case, we only have one node, but if you are doing this in a cluster that actually has more than one node, you would see one gadget pod per node because the gadget pod is then the one that is in charge of installing the BPF program in the kernel and running the BPF tracing. And that one needs to be run in each of the nodes when, when we want to do some tracing. And so what we did with the network monitor, network policy monitor was we asked this gadget pod to create this BPF tracing uh, program that traces TCP connections. And so the program captures whenever there's a new TCP connection and it stores that in one of the maps that Alvin talked about. And then the log created looks somewhat like this. The entries are either accept or connect. They are tracing the TCP accept and connect calls. And they include a lot of information like the name of, of the pods, the ports, uh, the IPs, uh, the labels that were involved. And all of this information is like, it's kind of a lot to parse. So it's not something that you would want to parse as a human, but rather the network policy gadget comes with a subcommand called report that processes this information and generates a basic network policy from it. Of course, this network policy is not intended for you to like just use it blindly. It's a start that we can use to start to make sense of what is going on with the application, but not like just say, okay, this is the network policy to apply and we should apply it on our cluster. Of course not. All right, let's now go back to our console and let's see if our pods are all running. Yeah, we see that they are all running. They've been running for a while. So probably we already have enough data, then we can stop our monitor and run, as I was saying, run the report, right? So what we will do is run kubectl gadget network policy report and then dash dash input and the file that we created, net, network trace.log, and then redirect the output to network policy.yaml. All right, this created a file. Um, let's close the other one and we can then look at this file. And it's a long file because there were a lot of network policies to create, but basically we can see that for each of these different services, uh, it says who needs to talk to who in which ports. So we see the different labels, the different ports, either for ingress or for egress or for both. And as I said, this, the idea of this file is that you can then use it as a basis. And if you need more, maybe you need to generate additional traffic and not just like bringing up the pods, but generate extra traffic that actually makes it capture all the possible situations. But even then there might be some situations that you don't capture and then you need to apply some like thinking on whether these are the right policies. Okay, I hope that was interesting. Uh, this demo is now finished. I'm going to delete these bots And now Alvin can tell you more about other gadgets. Thanks, Maria. Uh, yes, so I will tell you more about the next gadget, which is TraceLoop. Um, to give a technical summary of TraceLoop, it's about tracing system calls in C groups using BPF on overwritable ring buffers. 
that sounds like a very complicated sentence. So I will detail um, over the next slide what it means and what it, what it is for. Um, so the idea with trust loop, um, the initial idea was uh, to remember the use case uh, using a trace. As a developer, I uh, really like to use trace to, develop, to debug my applications, to see what kind of system code they do, and to have a trace of what's happening. Uh, however, it's a bit difficult to use trace on Kubernetes. Uh, on one side, because trace can be slow, like it's not possible to use trace on all the pods, on all the process, on all the programs running on a Kubernetes cluster. That will slow down too much, and that will not work. And um, another issue is uh, I would like to, um, I often the use case where something crash in production, and uh, then it's too late to tracing it to trace it because the program has crashed, so the process does not exist anymore. So it's not possible to use stress on a program that does not run anymore. Um, so that become difficult to debug um, un unreproducible, unreproducible crashes when things crash a bit randomly, it's difficult to use stress. Uh, so the idea uh, that comes from that is to use the idea of a flight recover. It's like a, a ring buffer that uh, permanently record all the system calls done by other programs, by other ports running on your Kubernetes cluster. But instead of um, displaying that to the user, it just record on the, on the flight recorder system. system. And whenever something crash, we can look back into that uh, record, into that log to see what were the problem or try to get hints uh, why it crashed before. So that's what the idea is uh, now I can compare stress and trace loop. Is uh, both of can be used for debugging your applications, but it works in different way. First, the uh, technology used is different. Uh, for stress, it uses the Linux system called Ptrace. For trace loop, it, it doesn't use Ptrace, but it uses BPF on trace points. Um, that make it uh, a bit different. That make it faster for trace loop. Uh, the granularity is different. Um, stress, you either trace one process or several processes together, and you specify which process you want to trace. Uh, for trace loop, you specify which C groups you want to trace. So uh, a C group can be um, taking together several processes in one system D unit, for example, or one, um, one Kubernetes pod. Um, so so the issue is stress is slow and trace loop uh, can run fast, but uh, stress is a more um, established program. It uh, works in a synchronous way and you cannot lose any events. When you see the li lines output from stress, you necessarily see everything. On trace loop, uh, it works in an asynchronous way. It's just recorded in a buffer and it can lose events and sometimes it can fail to read uh, some parameters from your system, from your system calls. Okay. So now I go a bit in more details, how does um, trace loop works? Um, the first thing it does, it uses a BPA program, uh, attach it on the trace point sysenter. Sysenter is the trace point that is executed uh, every time an application does a system call on Linux. And what this BPF program will do, it will first look at the um, C group or, um, to identify which container it is. Uh, which pod on your Kubernetes cluster is running this system call. And depending on that, it will redirect the execution flow on different uh, other BPF programs to store the data about the system call in a different pairing buffer. That, will, uh, that means that every pod on your Kubernetes system will have um, a different ring buffer to store the events about the system calls. And that ring buffer is never uh, actually read unless the user asks for that. Uh, so whenever the user wants to debug something that happened before, the user can read that ring buffer using um, Inspector Gadget, for example. Okay. Um, so the user interface will look uh, in this way. We use the uh, kubectl gadget um, with a trace loop gadget. And we have a few subcommands to list the existing trace that exist and to see a different uh, trace that has been generated or to look at specific pods. 
Okay, so now I will um, show the same thing, but uh, on my terminal. So I will share my terminal. I hope you can see it. I will first go to this uh, trace loop directory where you can follow along and uh, make the same, um, uh, run the same command as me for, uh, if you follow uh, the, with me from this repository. Uh, first, I will look a bit which pod exists. So none on the default namespace, and there are a few um, in general. Then I will use this kubectl gadget trace loop command. And from there, there are several subcommands. Um, I can show them with less. You can list the uh, traces that has uh, been captured. Okay, by default is only look at the uh, default namespace. So in a similar way to other kubectl command, you can specify this uh, dash a um, flag on the CLI to say I want to look at all the um, all the namespace. Uh, that's a lot of stress. Uh, maybe if I make it a bit smaller, you can see the list. But here you see a lot of um, uh, trace that come from the demo namespace. That's the demo that Marka was running before uh, with this um, shopping application. So even though uh, the pods are not running anymore, uh, if I show the list of pods, there is nothing in the demo namespace. We still have this trace that exists for a little while, and I see uh, they have been terminated um, 10 minutes ago. Uh, I'll make it bigger again, so you can see something. Uh, let me see, let me show uh, to you things in the cube system um, namespace. Here you see there is one trace that has been recorded, and I will. Uh, I can show that one to see how it looks like. So if I take the trace ID, I can feed that to the kubectl gadget trace loop show command. And this will uh, dump the last uh, few system calls that has, have been executed from this uh, pod. Okay, let's see if it works as well for, the, for some of the other pod from the demo. Uh, Okay, I don't have pods anymore in this, but I can show um, things, for example, from this, um, from the name on a space, if I take one trace ID from the ad service, for example, I can show this. And here in the same way, uh, I see it was running a Java process and it ran different uh, system call. Uh, of course, that's not all the system call uh, forever because the amount of memory available to record that is uh, limited. But you can see the last few system calls and if it crashed, you can try to understand why it happened. Okay. Uh, now I will... Um, Go to my next example from this, um, that come from this readme file. I will split um, my terminal like this. And I will uh, do this next demo, which is about uh, tracing a pod uh, that crashed. So I will just run uh, a command, uh, a shell command here. Oops, sorry. Okay, I, run, I will start a new pod that uh, run just a shell script, and this shell script will execute some multiplication, save, save the result into a file, and then attempt to display the, the, the result of the multiplication. Um, yeah, of course, this shell doesn't work. There is a bug in a shell script, and I cannot see what was the result of this multiplication. Um, if you see, if you want to see the pod, I see it, uh, it returned an error uh, and did not manage to print the result. And moreover, if I decide to delete the pod or if it get deleted because it comes from um, a replica set or deployment that uh, um, restart the pod, for example, 
that it might be that the pod doesn't exist anymore. But even if the pod doesn't exist anymore, I can still uh, see if the trace exists still. So with scriptctl gadget trace loop list, I see that uh, about one minute ago, uh, there was this multiplication pod and there is still a trace available. So let's try to see uh, what was there. So uh, try to see this uh, this here, and I will make the screen bigger. So I see the last uh, system calls run by all the processes in that um, process, and there was some uh, processes which are uh, cat, the shell, uh, and so on. And let's see with less if I can go back to the multiplication, I see this BC uh, program read the multiplication to perform and it write the output. Uh, so here I could recover what were the system call on uh, the result that was lost. Even though the pod was deleted, I can still recover the trace um, uh, shortly after. Okay. So, um, let me go back to this slide. Um, that was the demo for the trace loop gadget. Um, next uh, gadget, um, I will talk a bit about the gadgets based on BCC. Uh, so in, in Inspector Gadget, there are a lot of uh, available gadgets, but a lot of them are not re-implemented from scratch. They are just picked from uh, BCC and adapted to make them work in Kubernetes. Uh, for example, uh, band snoop, exec snoop, and a lot of them are directly taken from BCC. Um, so it allows you to inspect different aspects of the operating system or network on, uh, on different things. Okay, uh, so what kind of user interface do we want for those uh, gadgets? Uh, when we work on the Kubernetes level, usually we don't really care about the specific PID or the specific node uh, that the application is using. Um, we work on a pod level, that's the basic deployment, sorry, the, the basic uh, unit that we care about on Kubernetes. Um, the, we don't want to specify PIDs, but we want to specify pods. And we want to uh, use Kubernetes native concept like labels on namespace instead of uh, uh, doing things like SSH on and on and so on. So the user interface I want is uh, something based on CryptTL that does not use SSH, so developers don't need to SSH on a specific node. And then they can uh, specify what they want to trace using labels on uh, pods. Uh, so taking the example of exec snoop, it looks like that. Uh, you can run the exec snoop uh, gadget and then specify which pod do you want to trace. And you can use one of those many different uh, flags, uh, either one of them or several of them together. For example, you can say, I want only uh, specific labels. Uh, so all the pods that are post label will be selected or only on a specific namespace or on a specific pod or a specific node and so on. If your pod have several containers inside, you can specify which container do you want to trace as well. Um, so that makes it like uh, useful, for example, when you have a deployment, um, a deployment will generate several uh, pods and they, it will add this um, suffix, this random, randomly generated suffix that you don't know in advance. So when you have a deployment, that's quite useful to be able to select by labels because you know which level it has, but you don't know yet what name, um, what pod name it will have. So how does it work? Uh, that's a bit difficult to implement because uh, when when you say CubeCTL gadget and you want to select on one level, the uh, set of pods that match that is a bit, um, it can change over time. So maybe there was no pod at the beginning that matched that and then pods are created and then they are destroyed and so on. So the set of pods to 
the set of pod to uh, monitor uh, is dynamic. Um, so in this example, we have one pod that is uh, monitored by two gadgets on, on so on. Uh, so how does it work behind the scene? Uh, so inspector gadget has this component running uh, in a gadget demon set called the gadget tracer manager. The gadget tracer manager is just a demon that implements a gRPC API. So it implements uh, different methods, like mainly four different methods on the gRPC API. And it can be informed on uh, new containers that are created on uh, new tracers. So let me go on. Uh, so you need to be informed of the set of containers that are running. And to do that, it uses a feature called the OCI hook, uh, pre-start and post-stop. So on OCI containers, uh, we, we have these hooks that uh, can be executed whenever a container starts or stop. And inspector gadgets use that to um, feed the information to the gadget trust manager so it knows which uh, container exists, which, which label, and so on. Uh, the gadget tracer manager also needs to know about the different tracers, so which gadget um, you are running at the moment. Uh, so when you do kubectl gadget, uh, it will uh, execute uh, on the node uh, this uh, shell script that will first inform the gadget tracer manager that I want to run this gadget with this um, label selector, for example. Then from this, the gadget tracer manager will know uh, uh, which container it should trace because it has information about the container labels. With that information, it will uh, update BPF maps. So in here, there will be one map, one BPF map for each uh, tracer. And the content of the map will be the list of containers that it need to trace. And then the when we actually execute the PCC um, tool, like exec-snoop in this example, the BPF program, it will uh, first uh, check if it's actually running on the pod it needs to trace or if it should uh, discard, discard the event. Um, so it will look at the map, see if the container, uh, um, if the currency group is one uh, selected by this uh, map, um, if not, then it will just return zero without actually do any tracing. And if yes, then it can uh, uh, capture the, the event. So that's how it works. If you have time at the end of this presentation, uh, we can actually go together to see a bit more in details, uh, but that's a picture of it. Okay, so now that you have some explanation about how um, BCC-based uh, gadgets work, we will try to, to apply that in practice. So let me go back to the terminal. Okay. Um, now let's go to this uh, next section about snooping operations. And let's uh, see what we can do here. Uh, so first, what I will do is uh, start the exec snoop gadget, and uh, we will see how it works. Okay, I start uh, a new screen, and uh, I will execute this uh, new gadget, exec snoop. And as I mentioned before, there is uh, many different uh, uh, selectors you can use to select what you want to trace. And here I will uh, want to select only on the default namespace and only the parts uh, with those, uh, with the label run equal cooking. So when I run that, it start to um, uh, show in real time the events, the execution of new process in this uh, in those pod. Um, but we we don't have any uh, pod with the, uh, with this criteria, so it doesn't show anything so far. Next, 
we will uh, start actually uh, a container uh, uh, with this label uh, cooking. And we, for the purpose of this demo, we will use this anti-pattern that uh, just curl a shell script and execute it. Um, so here we don't care too much about security. It's just for the purpose of the demo, where will we execute something there? Okay, so if I run this script, it's quite difficult to know what it will do because uh, we cannot see the script before it gets executed. Uh, but uh, first it will download this um, the container image and then uh, when it's done, it will start to, to display something. Okay, here it executes the shell script at the top and you see install uh, something. And at the bottom of the script, you can see from the gadget exec snoop, the list of commands that have been executed. Um, so that's quite useful. Here I can see that it uh, executed the RPM command and then the uh, install and delete files and so on. Okay. So this um, exec snoop gadget allows you to uh, see the different um, new process that have been executed. Um, and then that's allow you to debug what's being run. I will show uh, the next example uh, based on the Nginx application. Um, so here I have an Nginx application. Uh, if I go to the top, I see I, I have the content of a uh, website. And then um, the configuration from Nginx, and then the deployment where it will actually install uh, Nginx with a, a few replicas. Um, if I install that, okay, now I see that I have the pod running. I see that I have three different um, Nginx pod that uh, if I wait a few seconds, now they should be running. And then I will try to access it. And what I will show is um, there is some bug in this uh, Nginx pod and I will show how to debug this with Inspector Gadget. Um, let me go back to uh, the text. So that's what I've done so far. I've deployed the Nginx application. Uh, because I run on uh, Minikube, the way to access the service on Minikube is to issue that command. So I will do that. I will use the other green, sorry. And here I see uh, I can access this to, uh, to reach the Nginx endpoint. Um, here I get a 404 uh, Actually, the URL that was supposed to access was this hello.txt. But when I do that, um, I see it still doesn't work. I still get a 404 error. Um, so the question is why? Because when I look at the, oh, sorry. When I look at the content of the website, I'm supposed to have a hello.txt file to serve on Nginx. But when I curl it, it doesn't work. So to, to be able to debug this, I will use the open snoop gadget. Um, and I will use this open snoop gadget and select uh, the Nginx application. Um, you don't need to pay attention to the warning at the top uh, because I don't have the uh, right kind of feature, but don't worry, it will still work. Uh, here, it will display in real time the list of files that are open uh, by Nginx while I uh, try to curl this. So when I issue the curl command, I reach one of the Nginx pod 
and I see that uh, nginx try to open this file slash etc slash nginx slash html slash hello dot txt. And I see that the open system kernel returned an error, uh, minus one. So it means um, probably uh, the file it don't exist or it could not open it. Uh, with this information, I can uh, check again in uh, Nginx whether this file in etc Nginx HTML was really there. So here I have a config map uh, called Nginx data. And this Nginx data is uh, served as a volume called Nginx volume in this pod. And this uh, volume is mounted over slash var slash www. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the directory where Nginx looks for the file. Uh, Nginx looks in this other directory. So I will try to replace this by uh, the correct directory and see if it fixes my problem. Uh, one way to do this is to do kubectl um, edit, and I can edit uh, deployment, and I will edit this deployment that is running. So I get uh, as, um, the editor where I can look at the uh, current definition of the pods. And here in this uh, definition for the volume, I see it's mounted on var www. I will replace that by slash etc slash nginx slash html. And save that. Now Kubernetes is telling me that this has been edited. Oh, I see that nginx will start. So I get new uh, pods. That's actually if I do get pod. I see the previous deployment is terminating and the new one is has been started now. Okay, so next let's try to do curl again to see if it works. Now it, it um, it works this time. I see that uh, the hello file return uh, this high message as you can see here. And um, at the top, I see that um, every time I hit, um, not every time, so that seems to be a demo effect, but it's supposed to be every time I hit the uh, Nginx server, it will open this file and uh, display this information. Okay, so that's uh, the end of this uh, demo for the using OpenSnoop um, to debug uh, Nginx uh, deployment. Now, I will just uh, delete that. So, so I can go back to the slide now. Thanks. And then Yeah. So up until now, we've been seeing uh, how to use Inspector Gadget, which is one of the tools that we we said we were going to demonstrate today. And now it's time to look at the other tool, which is kubectl trace. So kubectl trace is similar in many ways to Inspector Gadget in that it's a kubectl plugin. It creates its own pod and it allows us to run BPF traces in our clusters, but it's also different in how it works. So we will first explain a little bit about how it works and about the syntax and everything involved. And then we will see some hands-on exercises of, of kubectl trace in action. So kubectl trace is kind of a wrapper around another tool called BPF trace. And BPF trace has its own domain specific language that allows us to write BPF expressions that then 
run what we want to like do what we want to do they they run our traces without us having to run write a c program so we don't need to do all these complex things that alvan explained writing the c program compiling it installing it in the kernel we just write this bpf expressions and bpf trace uh, gets all the rest of the work done for us uh, of course these expressions are not simple <laughs> so they are a little bit complicated a little bit scary at the beginning if you haven't looked at this before but once you understand the general structure it, it's a lot easier so first i will go a little bit into what's the syntax of vps trace like so this is what the syntax of vps trace looks like um this is just one expression but it has the always has this similar pattern of probe, filter, and action. And the probe represents what it is that we want to trace. There are many different probes available. And in this example, the probe is a kernel function that is called do nanosleep. So the trace will get activated each time this kernel function is called. The filter part is actually optional. So we could have an expression that doesn't have any filter. And the filter, of course, what it does is filter the events uh, according to whatever criteria we give it. In this example, we are checking that the process has a PID larger than 100, but we, we could also check things related to the common name, for example. And then the action is what we want to do when the probe gets activated. This can be counting, printing, creating a histogram, calculating the time spent, and a lot of different other things. And this is usually where things can get a little bit more complex. And this example here is actually kind of complex with so few characters. What we are doing here is using first the, the special variable com, which represents the name of the command that is being executed. And then this at sign with the square brackets means that we are creating a hash map and using com as the key in the hash map. And the action that we are doing is adding one to the value of the map at that key. So basically when this call finished running, it will have counted how many times each command with a PID larger than 100 called the do nanosleep kernel function. And we will be able to see this in a table command per command. And so this is just like the basic syntax. Uh, th as you can imagine, these expressions can get really complex. We will see a few more and we will cover the basics here. We will not go into like a lot of details, but if you want to learn more, because like you think this is super cool, uh, this link here, this workshop.bpf.sh is uh, a pointer to a great workshop that goes into a lot of details about BPF trace. This diagram shows us some of the BPF probes and how they in relate to what's going on in the operating system. In the example that we saw in the previous slide, we were seeing this K probe, which is like a kernel function, as I said. And we can see like all of these are different probes that we have available. We can trace things in user space using the uprobe or uread probe. We can trace syscalls, operations on block devices, network packets, CPU cycles, and a lot more. And so let's look at a couple more examples to have a little bit more idea of what kind of things we can do. Oh, there. So these are a couple more examples and they are taken from the VPF trace readme. In this case, we are using trace points. Trace points are points in the kernel code that kernel maintainers or kernel module writers have identified as interesting for debugging issues. There are a lot of different trace points. And if you want to know what trace points you have available, you can use the BPF tool, which lets you figure out what is available in your currently running kernel, because depending on the kernel version, you might have different trace points available. These trace points are maintained by the kernel developer. So they tend to be a little bit more stable than kernel functions. If we are using the kernel function, the K probe that we saw before, it can happen that the kernel function changes 
well, in name, maybe not so often, but the parameters it receives and it returns like that might change. So the trace points are usually more stable because the kernel tenant decided, okay, this is an interesting debugging point, and then it's probably going to stay that way. Uh, it's not guaranteed, but it's more stable in general. And so in these two examples, we are using the syscall trace points. Uh, this sysenter point is what happens when we start, uh, when a syscall starts. So basically this is how you would trace syscalls. In the first one, it's very similar to the one we saw before. It's creating a hash map and it's indexing by the command line and it's using this count function instead of the plus plus, but the effect is the same. So what it's doing is counting how many syscalls were called per command. The second example is more complex. Uh, it's counting the overall amount of syscall regardless of the command. So we are no longer filtering command per command. And then what we're doing here is clearing the map once per second. So every second this map is cleared and restarted and we would see like if we run this in the command line, we would see like every second how many syscalls were called and then the next second and then the next second and so on. And so, as I said, these are only like a couple of examples. There are a lot more in the GitHub repo of PPF trace. You can see a lot of one-liners and also more complex files, not just one-liners. And you can use these examples to like get a, some idea of what you can do. You do not need to understand all of the syntax of PPF trace to start experimenting with it. So that's just a pointer of like more examples that you can look at. Um, all right, and so that was PPF trace. And so how about kubectl trace? kubectl trace is, works a little bit different than inspector gadget because it doesn't have this handy namespace or label selection that we saw. So we need to tell it on which node to run or on which pod to run. But we cannot say just all the pods that have this label or everything that is on this namespace, we can't use those nice selections, we need to say either node or pod. And so these two examples that we have here show that we can give it either an expression, which were the expressions that I showed to you before, or a file. And the files basically have the same syntax, the same uh, expression, same language. It's just that when it gets complex, uh, this is no longer a one-liner. You may have like a three lines one-liner. And so it's better to have this in a file where you can have comments and it makes all of your expressions a little bit more understandable. But in the end, it's the same. It's just a question of like, it's complex enough to be stored in a file. This is a diagram of how kubectl trace works. And it's extremely similar to the one that we saw before with kubectl gadget, because the idea is very, very similar. It goes through the Kubernetes API, it deploys a pod, and then the pod is the one that applies the VPF tracing. One difference is that this trace runner pod is deployed on demand when we want to run our traces instead of making like one deployment and then having this gadget like in the gadget case we had one gadget pod that run the traces in the case of kubectl trace we have a trace runner pod that is created each time we want to run a trace so we will create several of them and but except for that the, the general architecture is very similar all right, it's time for another hands-on. And for that, I want to go back to my console. All right, so now we are in the, oh, sorry, something else. Yes, so we are in tracing. And well, the first thing we need to do is get this kubectl trace. So we have this handy get kubectl trace script that is very similar to the kubectl gadget one. It will first check if it's installed and if it's not installed, it will download it with crew uh, or if crew is not available, it will download the file. So basically the same thing. This is just installing the plugin in your machine if you don't have it installed. So let's run it. 
well, it was already installed because I had run this before. But um, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that is tricky when working with VPF is that you need to have the kernel headers available. And if you don't have the kernel headers on the node, you won't be able to run traces. So we said we are running an instance of Minikube that already comes with the headers, which is great, but these headers are compressed using the XZ format. And unfortunately, this latest version of kubectl trace does not include the XZ decompression tool. And so it can't access the headers because it doesn't have the tool. So what we need to do is use a modified version of the container that kubectl trace runs that does have this tool. And so we prepared that already. And if you're following along in the GitHub repo, there's, there's an alias that I'm going to copy and paste. Well, maybe I can do like what Alban did. This is in the readme. And if you go to the part that says the alias. So here, this is creating an alias called kubectl trace run that calls kubectl trace run and then passes a container that is modified to include the decompression so that kubectl trace can find the kernel headers. So I'm going to run this alias here. So now whenever I run this kubectl dash trace dash run, it will use the right container. Otherwise I would need to pass this parameter all the time and it would be very annoying. <laughs> all right, so we basically have finished the setup and now we can start running our traces. So the first thing I will do is look at which are the nodes that I have. So as I mentioned earlier, we are running Minikube and Minikube runs with only one node. But if you are running in a different cluster, you may have more nodes here. And we will be running our traces and passing Minikube as the name of the node where we want to run the trace. So let's run our first trace, kubectl trace run. And then we will pass Minikube as the node name. And then we will write an expression. In our expression, we will write an expression related to syscalls, but a different one than the ones that we saw in the examples. So. Try spawn syscalls, that's the same. Calls. But now, before we saw just sys enter, now we will say sys enter underscore star. And this will get expanded at all the different syscalls. And then in the action, we will create a hash map, but instead of per command name, we will say per probe, and this will be each of the syscalls. And then we will count how many of them we get executed. And yeah. Okay. So we have our expression. And when we run this, this tells us that a trace was created. So this is running. And we can do kubectl trace get to see the traces. And we see that this trace is running. And we can attach to this trace to see the contents. Uh, so this, this is running in the background and we can leave it running for as long as we want. And then when we want to actually see the contents of it, we can attach to it. So we do that by running kubectl trace, attach, and then this, this ID. Okay, we are attached, but the kind of trace that we wrote it just prints a table at the end when it finishes. So we are not seeing anything because it will print something at the end when it finishes. To do that, we will press Control C and it prints a table. Sometimes this fails and maybe in another of the examples it would fail, but if you see an error that says signal killed, it just means it fails and you need to do, to do it again. All right, we have this table and we see that we have a bunch of different syscalls and these syscalls were executed different amount of times. It's uh, very interesting, all the things that are going on in our cluster, even though we don't have actually anything happening. Uh, so I don't know, like looking at 
this long table of syscalls, I'm interested in write. So why is anything writing when we don't have actually any pods running? So why are we writing anything? So I will do a second control C and I will modify my syscall, my trace, I mean, <laughs> to capture the write syscall. And instead of counting the probes, because now it's only one probe, I will count the commands. Okay. So this trace is created. I wanted to show another thing, but I forgot, so it doesn't matter. This trace is created. I will now attach to it. And again, I will press Control C to see the table. Okay, so in this table, we see that there's a bunch of different commands that are calling the write function. And we see kubelet, etcd, kube API server. All of these commands are writing something somewhere. We don't know what it is that yet they are writing, but they are writing something somewhere. So let's have a look at one of them and what it is that they are writing. So I will pick the core DNS command and uh, I will try to figure out what it is that it's writing. So to do that, I will modify my expression once again. This time I will add a filter. Up to now, all the expressions didn't have any filters. So this time let's add a filter that says that the command needs to be core DNS. And in the action, instead of counting, we don't want to count anymore because we already saw the counts. What we want to see is actually see what it is that the command is writing. So in this case, I will do printf and print the contents of the buffer that the syscall receives. So this is, I want args buff. So this will print the contents of the buffer that the syscall receives each time it's called. This time we are not generating a table that counts and that needs to be uh, printed at the end. This time it will be an interactive function because each time the function is called, we will see this. And one thing that I wanted to show was that we can directly attach to it by saying dash dash attach. So if you know that you want to stay attached, if you don't want to like go do something else while the trace is running, you can just do dash dash attach and you are immediately attached to it. Okay, so we see that the core DNS process uh, is writing for or for not found. Uh, something is calling it, I don't know what, but something is calling it and trying to get slash and core DNS says, I don't have any slash. So four or four not found. Probably this is some kind of liveness check and probably this is like working as expected, but this is the writing that core DNS is doing like every second or so. All right, so that was interesting, I hope. Uh, let's move on to the next example. So in the next example, we will actually use one of these files that I mentioned that have all these commands uh, to make it like easier when the files are complicated. So we will look at this bash readline.bt file, which uh, yeah, includes some comments that explains what it is. And well, this was taken from the BPF trace repo where all this information is. And here is what the actual code does. So what it does is it's using the uret pro, which is one of the pros that runs in user space. And what it's doing is it's uh, binding itself to the read line function and getting the return of the read line function. But to do that, it's using this interesting variable called container PID that we see here. So this variable, we write it in our scripts and then through the pipeline of kubectl trace, it eventually gets replaced for the process ID that is actually running in that container. 
So it will not reach BPF trace as container PID, but it will reach it as an actual number. And so, um, yeah, so what, what this is doing and why it needs to do it, it's because it needs to have access to the actual bash co command, the actual file that contains the symbol of the read line function. Without the symbol of the read line function, it cannot attach itself to this function to get the return value. And so that's why it needs this variable here to be able to find this file. All right, and what the action, the action that it's taking is that it's printing the timestamp and then printing the return value of the function. Okay, so let's see this in action. So what do we do? We will... Okay, so first, let, let, let me split my screen. Okay. So the first thing we will do is run um, a pod where we will have an interactive bash session. So QCTL run IT RM restart never. We only want to run this once. Image Ubuntu. And then we will call this pod test pod because we need to have the name of the pod in order to run traces. And then we will run bash in the pod. Uh, okay, that wasn't IT, was it? Yeah, no. What did I do wrong? I don't know what's wrong. It should be a single dash for in front of dash. Oh, it's just one dash. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right. So this should download the Ubuntu image and eventually give me a bash prompt. Yes, I have a bash prompt and it's working. Okay. And now we can run this kubectl trace run dash f because we are passing a file bash read line and then we will say we will run in on this test pod and we want to attach so that we are already in interactive mode okay the trace is created it's attached and we are not seeing anything because we are not interacting with the bash yet but now whatever we do in this bash it will get printed over there and it doesn't matter if the command exists or doesn't exist. Whatever we type, it will get printed on the other side. And this is simply because what we are doing is attaching ourselves to the read line function. And so this is the output of the read line function. It doesn't matter what bash does with that output afterwards. Okay. So maybe you're wondering why are we like attaching ourselves to the read line function? Like this was not like a hacking uh, your friend's bots tutorial. But this is actually very useful if you want to debug. I mean, it's very common for us to try to debug and print stuff, uh, right? Like you edit your program, you add a printf to print something. But for that, you need to edit your program, recompile it. And maybe it's like a lot of work to do that. And so instead of doing that, you can attach yourself to a function and print what the function returns, and then you get more information about what's going on. So to do that, uh, to see that in a different example uh, of how you would use this for debugging, we'll now stop this. Um, we'll quit this part and stop this one. And we'll move on to the last kubectl trace example, and which is this Caturday YAML file that we have here. Uh, maybe. So this file uh, deploys an application called Caturday. Then what it does, it's, it shows an image of a cat 
each time you reach the container. It's very nice, funny application. It's a very simple deployment. You just, we just have a pod deployment and then the service and that's it. So what we will do is first deploy this application. Oh, something is already running that is using this port. So maybe I should run it on a different port. Okay, now it's running correctly. So we have this application running uh, similar to what showed, uh, what Alvin showed earlier about accessing Nginx. To access this application, we will need to run minikube service cutter day and then dash n cutter day because this is not in the default main space. And now we have a port where we can reach this cutter day application. And so we can curl this URL and port. And we can see that it's working. Cool. And if you're doing this at home on your laptop, you can actually go with your browser and visit this URL and you should see a very nice, cute cat picture. And while, every time you reload, you get a different cat picture, which makes it even nicer. All right, so this is working. Now let's say we are trying to debug a problem related to the counter uh, functionality of this application. This application has a counter and we think it might be not working correctly. So what we are going to do is run a trace that um, will attach itself to the function of the counter. The, yeah, the, there's a function called counter value and we will attach to the counter value function. And then we will see whether it's returning the right number or not. Maybe the problem is there, maybe the problem is somewhere else, but with this, we can see what's going on. I don't have the alias here. I also don't have the alias here. Okay, with all the opening and closing of the terminals, I lost my alias. So I'm going to paste the alias again. All right, so there, there's my alias. And now what I'm going to do is, okay, so first, first I want to get the pod name of my cutter day application. And now I want to run this trace on this pod. And I want to attach myself, dash A is the uh, short for that. And then the, um, I, I'm going to use you red probe again, like we used in the bash example. And the same thing about proc container pid. And then this time it's not beam bash, it's exe because that's what the executable is called. This is a go executable. And the function is called main counter value. Okay, and what we want to do is similar to the read lane example, we want to just print. And this time it's a number and red val. So it's just the return value of the function. Okay, the trace is created, this is running. And now on the other terminal, I'm going to do the curl, uh, which I forgot the URL. So I'm going to just do this again. Okay, so I'm going to curl this URL. And we can see, you can see up here that uh, it printed two because I only did two curls and that each time I hit this page, the counter gets 
incremented. So if we were debugging this application and we thought there was a problem with the counter, we actually see that the counter is working correctly and the problem must be somewhere else. And all right, so with that, we've seen a few examples of kubectl trace. Uh, as I said, there's a lot more things that you can do. Uh, it's very flexible and uh, yeah, it, it can be very useful if you're trying to debug stuff that you don't really know where to start and you can like dig deeper and deeper. And now Alvin has a few other interesting things to share with us. Thanks, Maria. Uh, yes, so I have a few extra to show. Um, I don't know if we will be able to go through all of them, but um, if not, you can just uh, go through them on your own by following the documentation on this GitHub repository. Um, so let's go for it. I go to the extra directory. And what I will show first is um, I, I will go into, I will start um, inspector gadget um, tracing and then try to understand how it works behind the scene. And in order to do that, uh, uh, I will demonstrate the BPF tool and some BCC tools as well. So let's start with this command here. Um, let's first run this exec snoot uh, gadget on the selector uh, role e equal extras. Um, at the moment, I don't have any uh, anything running uh, with this label. So if I do kubectl get pod um, uh, there is nothing with the extra Nothing with an extra label. Uh, so to understand what it does, uh, I will go to the node, minikube SSH, that will be a root. And here I will try to understand uh, what it is that the XX snoop gadget uh, do in order to uh, get the pod uh, with this label. So let's see. Let's see if I can find the exec snoop process. Here it is. I see one um, Python program executing exec snoop, and it uh, selects here the role extra uh, label by using this uh, uh, command here. So what it does is specify a BPF map that contains the list of um, the container that it should trace. So this, if I look at it, it looks like a regular file, but uh, actually it's not. It's on the BPF file system. A BPF file system, it's a virtual file system that shows uh, some maps that are attached to, the, to that place. Uh, it's not a regular uh, file. Actually, if I try to do cut, I see I cannot just print the output. So that's because BPF map, in order to uh, interact with them, you need to use this BPF system call. Uh, on, on the command line, you can do that with the BPF tool uh, command. Uh, unfortunately, BPF tool uh, is not installed on Minikube. Or, uh, so what I will do, I will run um, BPF tool using uh, a Docker container. So I will show. Ah, okay, sorry, I'm inside the... I will divide the screen again, so I can show... I can copy-paste the command because it's a bit long. Here it is. Um, what I will do 
I will run this uh, docker run command and the container I will execute is a kinfork PPF tool. That's a container that uh, just packaged this PPF tool program. And from there, I will run the BPF tool command and uh, display the content of uh, this map. So let me do that now. I'll take this command and I display the content of this file, uh, of this BPF map, but I will take the one used by uh, my uh, open snook, uh, sorry, exec snook gadget. So if I do that, uh, it needs to download the Docker image first, and then it will run the BPF tool gadget, uh, BPF tool container, and then it will display the content of the map. But as I mentioned before, since I don't have any pod with this uh, label, the content of the map should be empty because at the moment it should not display anything. It, it has nothing to trace. But Let's see how it looks first. Okay, so the BPF tool say found zero elements. It means there are nothing in this map. So there are no parts to trace. And if I run it again, it shows the same thing again. Okay, so now I will uh, start some parts with this uh, all equal extra um, um, on here. Oh, sorry, not here. Sorry, I will uh, take the command from here. So let me start a first container with this. As you can see, there is this whole equal extra level. Okay, now I have a shell inside this container with this, uh, with the correct label. And I will start a second container where still with the same uh, role extra label, but I will call it differently. Okay, so now I have a different shell. Uh, just for completeness, I will um, start a third shell but this time without the role equal extra. So it should, should check that this one should not be traced. Okay, so now I have three containers and two of them should be traced by this uh, kubectl gadget xx snoop command. Uh, so let me execute some command in some of them. In this one, I execute uh, echo shell one. In this one, I execute shell two. And in the third one, you can guess it, I execute echo shell three. Um, so now what I see in this, I uh, see that exec snoop only traced the first two commands, but not the third one, because the third one didn't have the correct label. Um, and it's still run with this with this uh, filter here. So now if I look at the content of this map, I see that the map contains two entries and that should be the two containers that it should trace. So the container for the first shell and the container for the second shell, but not the third one. Um, how do we actually understand this? Um, so what it did here, uh, I filter the, um, one second, uh, what was the filter? It was a filter with this dash dash mount namespace map um, command. Uh, what it does is specify a map that will contain the mount namespace ID of the container. Uh, so the mount namespace is something you can see when you're in the container in proc self namespace. You have different namespace and one of them is the mount namespace. And you can see in this container, it has this mount namespace uh, with this ID. 
if I look at a different container, uh, it has a different amount, uh, namespace ID. Or this one as well. Oops. It has uh, yet another uh, mount namespace ID. So this mount namespace ID is is the content of uh, this key here. Uh, here, that's a representation in hexadecimal, and here, that's a representation in decimal. So I need to convert uh, that to make sense of it. And uh, I did a command here to show how to do that. Um, here it is, this printf command. Uh, what it does is uh, look at the uh, mod namespace, look at the um, inode number, and uh, because I'm running on a little Indian machine, it means that the uh, least significant bit are displayed first. Uh, but the representation here is the reverse. So I, um, yeah, I used to use, I need to use this command tag to reverse the order of the different bytes to display them in the correct order. But uh, if I do this correctly, I have the representation of the mon namespace ID in hexadecimal in the correct order. And I can do that for the three different containers. Here it is. So in my map, I should have uh, this one and this one, but not this one. So let's see if I have A903 on F0. A903, 00, F0. Okay, and the other one, 16, 0, 4, and so on. 16, 0, 4, and so on. So in this way, I uh, showed that um, how it works behind the scene. It uses a BCC uh, tool, but the BCC tool doesn't actually know about Kubernetes level. The only thing it will do, it will look at the content of the map to know whether it should uh, capture the events from this container or not. And the content of the, this map is um, written by the uh, Inspector Gadget uh, Tracer Manager. And that's uh, what I showed in my previous slide uh, with this gRPC API before. Okay. Um, I don't know if there is time for uh, more example. Um, if no, yes. I think we are, we are basically out of time. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so I will stop here, but um, yeah, you can uh, you can uh, basically try this uh, for yourself and um, continue the guide to understand more how it works behind the scene. Yeah, and we will stay around in the chat answering questions. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. <laughs>